think we'll uh, I think we'll begin. Well, listen. Thank you very much indeed for staying until the the bitter end. We've got uh, a very distinguished panel basically to uh, convene the graveyard shift. I promise you, there are no vampires on stage, at least uh, not in daylight anyway. Um, what I thought I might do to begin with is to recap some of the, the, the main points that came out of the earlier plenary sessions. And I thought David Murray, to begin with, was, was very interesting in terms of the highlighting the importance of culture uh, and cultural dynamics and how one can shift culture within organizations, and in particular, this notion that institutional investors have an obligation, if you will, to exercise their ownership uh, responsibilities. Um, I thought it was interesting that he noted that there was a concern in the submissions about how do we improve competitiveness of the system and a concern amongst uh, certainly the regulated of over-regulation. I thought David Gallagher's research highlighting the importance of deregulation as a key word in these submissions in itself speaks volumes. Um, but David Murray also talked about the need for a rebalancing of our regulatory setting and that a key aim of this inquiry is to design a system which is going to be fit for purpose and is going to stand the test of time so that we do have an opportunity to recalibrate our system to uh, ensure that the system will stand the test of time over 15 years. And I thought it was also important that he emphasized that regulators and indeed society does actually need to give cognizance to the fact that crises are inevitable, that crises will happen. We can't have a zero failure regime. That will not actually work. I think then moving on from that, we had Bob Officer, and I thought his remarks were, were very interesting in relation to uh, is there a genuine concern about fees and the level of fees within superannuation? Is it too high? Uh, he was of the view that this is overblown and very little evidential basis. He also felt that house prices were perfectly fine in Australia. I would note that in 2007, the three most overvalued property markets in the world were Dublin, now down 65% of peak. The Costa del Sol came in number two. It is now 75% of peak. And the third most overvalued property market in the world in 2007 was good old Sydney. Um, whether it should remain so is another matter. I thought it was also interesting uh, that Professor Officer talked about the need to revisit the four-pillar banking system, whether this foundational uh, um, policy should in actual fact be, be changed. Uh, his criticism, if you will, of uh, stress tests, uh, you know, regulation by hypothetical, and moving instead into uh, the development of a risk premium, I thought that was kind of an interesting um, uh, set of remarks. Then we had Alan Cameron, and I thought, again, this was interesting in the sense, which is reflected in a lot of the submissions that we've seen to the inquiry, that the basic policy setting is fine in the main, but at the same time, basically a concern that ASIC in particular uh, should not have any more uh, uh, mission added to its mission, that mission creep is actually highly problematic. But also uh, making the point that ASIC really needs to take its obligations as an enforcer very seriously. And that an implicit criticism, if you will, of enforceable undertakings that perhaps in actual fact there should be litigation and litigation to a judicial conclusion. Uh, and in many ways this reflects the view of Steve Cutler, the former head of enforcement at the SEC, uh, who in 2002, at the height of the Enron uh, scandals, remarked to me that an agency which has a 100% litigation success rate is simply not litigating enough, that we should, in actual fact, accept the notion that there will be failure. Then moving on to Tom Carp, I thought, again, this was interesting in relation to the policy settings are broadly okay, but there are boundary issues. And some of these boundary issues basically are being dealt with by the Council of Financial Regulators, the 
the issue to what extent this happens in an open and transparent manner uh, is another matter that perhaps we can come on to. Uh, and again, this notion that disclosure is not a panacea, that there is a problem with the disclosure paradigm. And this raises the question of what you replace disclosure with. But I think in a way this mi misses the point of the disclosure paradigm because the disclosure paradigm was set up initially by James Landis and it's the 50th anniversary of his death this, uh, this coming year and the 80th anniversary of the creation of the SEC. And in Landis's view, disclosure was not an end, it was a means to an end. And that end is truth and security. So uh, we've lost sight of what disclosure's purpose actually is. And this brought us on then to Mike Callahan, and I thought his plea that there should be uh, a very clear narrative underpinning this financial services inquiry, uh, that yes, there needs to be technical change, but there needs to be an underpinning narrative. And of course, we had that underpinning narrative with the Wallace inquiry. In fact, there's a whole chapter in Wallace in relation to regulatory philosophy based on market ordering, based on the efficient market hypothesis. How efficient is the market? Well, that's another matter entirely. Um, but also making the point that we can't navigate by sight. We're, we really need to have a fundamental series of conversations about regulatory purpose. And of course, that brings us to uh, Professor Honohan as a quite, I think, interesting interview, uh, if I say so. Uh, but interesting in the sense that Ireland really did buy into the regulatory ethos of light touch regulation. It wasn't an outlier in that respect. Uh, it was very much following the lead of the United Kingdom. Uh, and it's paying a huge price for that. And as a consequence, it has recalibrated its banking system. Uh, and I thought some of the lessons that uh, uh, Ireland has gone through do have implications for, for, for here in Australia. Now, we want to make this as interactive a session as we possibly can. Uh, if you have a question, please put your hands up. I wait for the roving mic to come. Uh, Veronique at the back here has it. And if you could give us your name and your uh, affiliation, that would be very useful for the purposes of, of, of the video. But perhaps I can start by asking each of the panel uh, members an uh, 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 initial series of questions, I suppose. And I suppose the first to Kevin Davis. Uh, uh, what did you learn today? What did I learn today? Oh, dear. I think I'm suffering from submission overload, uh, among other things. But there were, I thought, very good points made uh, about the need for a clear statement of a vision of what the financial system, how it should develop, how we want it to develop. And of course the issue there is to what extent do you rely on purely the evolution of markets or the role of regulators and government? Because clearly markets don't evolve in isolation. They evolve within the scope of the law and regulation and, and there's a need for identifying to what extent we want to let markets develop unfettered or try and guide them in various ways and with what objectives. So I think that was very important. A second uh, very important point uh, was the, uh, the, the statement of a need to make sure that we have a clear regulatory philosophy, identifying what we think is right with Wallace, what was wrong with Wallace. I think with hindsight, there are a lot of aspects of Wallace that can certainly be challenged. You mentioned a couple of them, the extent to which markets are efficient. Uh, to what extent can we assume that individuals are rational uh, or do we need to rep uh, think about people as being behaviourally biased? And I know Bob Officer would make the point that essentially lots of people would be behavi behaviourally biased, uh, but as long as there are some rational traders out there, markets may end up giving you the efficient outcomes you expect. Um, so I think there are a lot of issues that, uh, on top of those that we need to think about in terms of the, the regulatory philosophy. And I guess there are two of the main things, I think, that mm. overarching vision of what we want the system to be, and secondly, how we think it, uh, it operates in the role for regulation. Well, let's keep with this issue of, of, of regulatory philosophy. If I can move to Peter Kell, you're on the front line as a, as a, as a regulator. Um, what's your philosophy? <laughs> uh, <coughs> well, uh, Justin, uh, I might turn that away from my philosophy, which would, only, would take several hours to explain. <laughs> uh, so rather than doing that, I'd like to focus in on, on one of the points that I think Kevin has alluded to and that's come up a fair bit, and 
that um, goes to this issue of the role of disclosure as an underlying principle uh, for structuring your regulatory requirements on your regulatory regimes because that was obviously central to the way that the Wallace inquiry uh, approached regulatory philosophy uh, and uh, central to ASIC sort of powers. So I, I won't be able to do it justice, this is a sort of simplified version, but in many ways the, the approach that we've had over the last 15, 20 years has been sort of anything goes as long as you disclose, uh, that uh, you can issue any sort of product out there, which um, has certainly enabled a wide range of choice. Uh, as long as you disclose, you can uh, have any sort of remuneration structure with uh, conflicts of interest embedded in it. Uh, as long as you disclose, uh, the products can involve any level of risk as long as you disclose, so on and so forth. Now that's not a particularly nuanced version, but that captures the, the sort of approach. And I think one of the lessons that we've had uh, since then has been that that, that sort of approach um, uh, puts too much weight on disclosure to address market problems. Uh, so we've had a situation where too often the approach has been um, disclosure is the answer. Now what was the question again? Uh, so I think uh, from, from ASIC's perspective it, as a disclosure regulator, disclosure is still central to the regulatory philosophy that underpins our powers, but we're increasingly looking at areas where disclosure is not providing the solution, it's not addressing the market failure, it's not improving market outcomes, all it's doing is imposing costs mm. on those who actually have to produce the disclosure documents. And perhaps to go to Kevin's point, one of the lessons I think we're drawing from fields such as behavioural economics is that people, in terms of their behaviour, their divergences from using information optimally, which underpins the disclosure regime, that those divergences are not random or trivial, they're systematic and significant, and that we ought to take those into account when we think about regulation and when we look at what uh, disclosure is actually best um, designed to fix. So to give one example, I think uh, ASIC would make the case that uh, conflicts of interest, especially in retail markets, are not particularly well addressed by disclosure and it's time to change the mm. sort of philosophical basis to thinking about that. And do you think in relation to that, that uh, you become susceptible to claims of regulatory overreach unless your mandate is actually changed to reflect what you're trying to achieve? Uh, well, we, we have made an argument that w one of the problems with the very heavy weight on disclosure is that as it's become a sort of one-dimensional toolkit um, and that we end up uh, requiring what can often be quite expensive disclosure on the part of issuers in situations where it's not really fixing the problem. And that doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help the, the product issuers. It doesn't help the consumers. So we are making a case that there perhaps needs to be more flexibility in the regulatory uh, toolkit. And we're already seeing examples of that. So for uh, in, the, in the credit space, um, the recent reforms that have introduced uh, responsible lending requirements I mean, that goes beyond disclosure. We've worked very carefully with the industry to ensure that that um, uh, has been implemented in a way that, uh, that they can manage. And it's, I would say, has certainly helped to drive down the incidence of some of the problematic lending practices that we were seeing a few years ago. Now, this is inquiry encompasses much more than banking, and we'll come back uh, to the banker in a second. But, uh, uh, but Pauline, Superannuation has emerged as the fifth pillar, if you will. Um, is the regime fit for purpose? Current indications are that it is, but will it continue to be fit for purpose in an environment that is changing so rapidly? So when you look at the way the system has changed and everybody talks about the $1.8 trillion uh, you know, the fact is that most people are in default. Most money is not in default. So about a third is in default, where it's looked after by prudentially regulated trustees. About a third is in drawdown, and a third is in choice. So, and you've got many, many different structures. It's not just superannuation money. A lot of the money is in, got $170 billion in banks. A lot of it is overseas. 
They're in assets across the whole economy and in unregulated and regulated financial services across the Australian economy. So, and you've got a very different consumer. You've got a consumer that now wants and needs and expects to make a lot more decisions about how their money is applied and used, both when it is in man managed by somebody else and when it's in their hands. So with all of those changes, you've got to make sure that it continues to be fit for purpose because the bottom line is the tax concessions are funded by taxpayers and they expect value for money. And the second, and equally important is that it is a substantial pool in the economy. It must do its role in the economy. And making sure that it fits those two purposes, including reducing the burden on the government in terms of the age pension and other social security, uh, it, it, it's a complex. And so you can't just say that nothing needs to change. Mm. And with the rise of the self-managed super sector, does that reflect, do you think, at least in part, a lack of confidence by many owners of self-managed super funds that in actual fact they can't trust either the retail or the industry sector? Look, I think trust is, is one of the drivers of people going to self-managed funds, but as the research says, there's a number of, of drivers. People like the flexibility. Uh, there's a cultural issue in terms of people like to do it themselves. There is a real desire to invest in asset classes that they really understand, such as, as property. So there's opportunities there that they may not get, get, get in, in, in other areas. There's also, of course, the fact that there is a bit of regulatory arbitrage and there are avenues for growth in bits of financial services businesses and, and other types of businesses. Um, concerning a, a group of consumers. So we've got to look at all those drivers and look at where, whether those drivers are, are the right ones going forward. Stephen, uh, the Australian banks came out of this crisis in much better state than, than uh, many other countries with perhaps partial exception of Canada. Um, is that because do you think that they are uh, culturally restrained um, or was it because the regulatory settings were appropriate in the Australian context? Well, I think the answer, Justin, is like with all these things, there's no one reason. I mean, we had, we did have well-managed banks. We had a good and effective regulator, particularly in APRA, and its strong focus on effective supervision. I mean, one of the things that often gets overlooked in the whole we need to regulate the banking sector debate around the world is the fact that it was from a regulatory point of view, it wasn't a lack of regulation, it was a lack of effective supervision and a lack of effective application of that regulation. And I think your interview, in fact, with the head of the um, Central Bank in Ireland, he made that point as well. And, and look, we were lucky as well. We had China on our doorstep. The Chinese handled the crisis very well, which meant that we continued to benefit from their economic growth. Uh, and we had a strong fiscal position at the time and the government of the day reacted very swiftly uh, in part because it was prepared to talk to the commercial banks as well as the regulators about what needed to be done. So there's a whole host of reasons why we came through. But the point I think all of that illustrates and we can't lose sight of is we actually have a system that worked well. Now that's no excuse for complacency, but it should put us in the sort of mindset that says, well, when we're looking at what system we need for the next 5, 10, mm. 15 years, our starting point should be we've actually got a system that works well to date, so how do we enhance that mm. rather than how do we tear that down to rebuild some mm. theoretical new model? And what do you think could or should we do if you were providing uh, advice directly to Kevin now? Um, what, what would that advice be? Well, it's, it's contained in a uh, rather large <laughs> submission, <laughs> which I was telling... We said, to, yes, before you do anything, do no harm. Um, I, I was telling some of the panel members, we did distill that uh, inch and a half thick submission down to 140 characters. Um, so there's a number of ways in which we can communicate it. But I pick up Kevin's point earlier, I think it is an opportunity to have a sensible, calm and deliberative look at the underlying principles that we do apply across to the system. Um, but picking up some of the discussion, in part what we've heard today, but what we're hearing more publicly as well, we've got to be very wary of applying black and white mm. analyses. So we hear, you know, Wallace assumed that markets were perfectly efficient and clearly they're not. 
and therefore there's a problem. And we hear that you know, disclosure doesn't work, therefore something else is needed. I think we're actually capable in Australia of a much more nuanced and sophisticated discussion. Is disclosure a universal panacea? No, of course not. Does it serve a useful purpose? Yes, of course it does. So I think we need to work through at a much more sophisticated level what we actually want going forward. And that's, I mean, that's why an inquiry like this is a mm. real opportunity. And do you think that debate is an actual fact taking place uh, in, in Australia at the moment in, in, in terms of media discourse? Um, look, you know, the Australian media is the, amongst the highest quality in the world, and I understand they're present today. Um, <laughs> uh, and that is on the record. <laughs> um, the, I think, look, I, I actually feel we've actually, the, the inquiry so far has actually got off to a very good start. Now that's, you know, I've got to be careful saying that because, you know, maybe it'll get reported, you know, banks happy with direction of inquiry, and that's not necessarily going to be a good thing for me in the long run. But... I think the nature of the discussion, the nature of the quality of the submissions to date has actually been strong in that ma the majority of them are actually focusing on this idea about how do we make sure a system that has served us well continues to do that into mm. the future. And we'll have a range of ideas about you know, how to do that. And, you know, just to you know, enliven Peter here, you know, ASIC clearly wants half of the ACCC's responsibilities to be able to do that, for example, which we wouldn't necessarily support. Um, but I think, you know, we, we now, we're off to a good start and I think now what we need to make sure is we just keep focused on, you know, what is the framework that we ultimately want to serve the, the Australian economy and through that Australian people. And obviously at the same time one has to be cognizant of international developments and one of the most important international developments facing the banking industry has been the global investigation into LIBOR and now expanding beyond that into currency manipulation. And what we're seeing is the introduction of competition uh, regulators into this space, most notably the European Union, but we've seen just in the last month the, uh, the Commerce Commission in New Zealand also beginning to enter into this space. Now what it's investigating, we don't know, but we do know that it's investigating on the foot of the leniency application, so therefore someone has turned state witness, uh, uh, raising all sorts of interesting questions because if we're looking at problems within, not just within individual institutions, but within the sector as a whole, and in Europe we've had basically a settlement on a cartel investigation, that raises profound questions, it seems to me, about the integrity of the financial system. Kevin. I guess my response to that would be that the sort of things you've described are issues that are relevant across any industry. Mm. Things like manipulation, uh, 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 tax, tax fraud, uh, money laundering, all of those sorts of issues are things that could be relevant in any area. It's something we have to, we have to be concerned with, obviously. But I'd sort of put it separate to sort of the issue of philosophy of regulation and so on, because it does come down to mm. the more general issues of governance and the rule of law and so on, I think. So I'd be inclined to put those, not out of the frame, but, but put them to one side and not let them distract us from sort of the more general issues of what should be the, the approach to the philosophy of regulation. I guess the only thing that, that worries me in saying that is, of course, there's much more scope for doing it mm. in banking and the financial sector where large amounts of money are, are involved and can be easily used. Yeah. But going, going through the, the submissions, that, that at least those that have been made public at this stage, I mean, I, I quite a lot focus on technical issues rather than this broader question of regulatory philosophy. And as we heard earlier uh, from David, a lot are uh, very much broadly endorse the policy settings at the moment. Are you suggesting that perhaps we, we need to have a more root and branch review? My personal view is that I think in terms of philosophy of regulation, there is a lot of need to rethink the, the Wallace approach. Uh, I think there is lots of, uh, apart from the practical evidence of the GFC and the issues of stability, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, literature out there in the academic world uh, that tells you things like banks are subject to runs. Mm. You know, standard uh, diamond dibbig type analysis that says because of the nature of the financial contract that involves asymmetric information and so on, uh, we can't expect markets to behave like the markets of Economics 101. Mm. Uh, now, exactly where that takes you in terms of to what extent do you need regulation, what is the right sort of regulation, uh, that's a much more difficult question. 
Uh, and I guess that's where I would have actually liked to have seen a lot more submissions from academics who have been looking at these sorts of issues about the ways in which markets function, uh, sorry, the ways in which financial markets function, the way in which the financial system as a whole fits together, including the spillovers and contagion uh, and so on, uh, to help us with that idea of working out exactly how do you mm. readjust the, 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 philosoph uh, the philosophy of regulation. One, one is reminded of uh, John F. Kennedy's famous phrase, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, <laughs> ask what uh, um, you, you can, can do, do for your country. Uh, Pauline, what can the superannuation industry do for the country? There's two sides of that question. You've got the system, what can the system do and what can the industry do? Uh, I think, and just touching on regulatory philosophy uh, as, as well, uh, the, the two big factors are the, the digital changes. I mean, that, that is a game changer for the superannuation industry and what it can do but also the, the in, in interdependency. Uh, look, I, I think first and foremost, the, the, the system and, and the industry can make sure that it has a clear role in the allocation and the efficient allocation of capital. And what we're seeing more and more is so being able to invest in the whole of the ASX. I mean, we just invest in, in, in the top bit. Mm. Uh, the way we're invested across the banking sector is, is that efficient. Um, uh, we are about long-term capital. Banking is more about short-term capital. Do we have the calibration right? And are we really set to invest money in a way most needed for an ageing population that wants the steady income streams? Now, have we, have we removed all the impediments in terms of those long-term investment, particularly infrastructure? Now, have we got that risk reward right? What are we doing about, about the bond market? It's still very thin in, in Australia, and, and the list goes on. So, I, you know, I, I think there is a great deal more the industry could do and the system could do. I think there are a lot of roadblocks to that. I think our approach to liquidity is not quite right, uh, and we can change, we, we, you know, we, we can change, change that. Um, but we're also seeing, because we see the underbelly of the Australian population, you do start to see risks. And, and we all know, and you talked about money, people are starting to retire on big money. It is the new consumer. Um, how are we going to protect them? How are we going to make sure? Um, some, some of the particularly frailer el elderly Australians, there's, there's massive loss there, up to 20, um, somebody was saying, up to 30% of loss in the UK or the US is as you get older and it's mainly your family members. I mean, we've got a whole changing demographic. They're all reliant on a financial system. We've got payment systems, we've got the banking system, payment system, the superannuation payment system. They don't actually work together anymore. You've got the electronic link into the funds management system and the insurance system, that doesn't quite work. So I think they're the conversations, a bit too micro for this conversation that we need to have to make the system more flexible to adjust to the Australian economy. And do you think are we, are we stuck with the defined contribution model rather than perhaps rethinking maybe we should move towards, if possible, a defined benefit and therefore change the risk calculation? Well, we're moving towards a defined benefit anyway because your asset and liabilities has to match mm. and that's the core of post-retirement. Mm. I mean, the pure D, DB scheme, we're long gone because people change jobs now and that, that whole scheme and that whole structure was based on people staying in the same job for 20, 30 years mm. and employers being willing to take the liability on their balance sheets. Well, they just can't do that anymore. Mm. And, you've got to un, you know, and you've got to question whether that is actually an efficient allocation of, of capital. But the thinking of DB has to creep back in and the robustness around DB for matching that asset and liability definitely has to now be embraced. And I suppose in a way we're, we're locked in a situation where we differentiate between sophisticated and retail uh, investors, but I suppose we're, we're all sophisticated in the sense that we all invest so much money through our pension funds, etc. Um, but one of the things that's happened with, a, with litigation here in Australia, which is the Winjikarabi case, notably taken by a class action rather than by the regulator itself, uh, but the judicial criticism was of, of the regime was really quite profound, Peter. 
yes, and it really came down to, I think, one of the, if we're looking at lessons from the problems or, or collapses over the, the past 10 or 15 years, that um, one of the, the key problems emerges where you have a misalignment of risk, where you have people investing in products or putting their money somewhere where they think the risk is here and it's actually up here. And that might, misalignment might have emerged for a variety of reasons. It might have been a, a failure of disclosure. It might have been <coughs> the way in which the products were sold and marketed. Uh, and that's obviously something that uh, we need to learn from. Why, in what circumstances does that misalignment of risk emerge? And in what circumstance, what, what is the best tool to uh, uh, address that? And that's, that's something that quite a few submissions have, have looked at. I mean, Justice Rose was very explicit on this point that mm. the behaviour of, of Grange, uh, I mean, it's sold as Lehman Brothers Australia, but let's be honest, this was a homegrown crisis. Grange was a homegrown entity. Uh, but Justice Rose suggested that Grange's behaviour was basically like shooting fish in a barrel. And by any change in the amount of money one has to have capable of being invested, then Windsor, Bar Windsor Carberry Council, like any of the other councils, would be deemed to be a sophisticated investor. Is that sustainable anymore? Well, it's uh, something that uh, the Treasury put a paper out on uh, not that long ago, uh, that division between what is uh, sophisticated, retail versus sophisticated, I think is a, a live one and, and warrants consideration for, if, if only for the reason that Pauline raised, mm. which is with superannuation, people are going to be retiring with larger sums and to simply uh, define them as sophisticated mm. because they've got a larger amount of money is not necessarily a sensible thing to do. So that. It's, 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 a, it's a good question, it's a relevant question, it's one that we're thinking about at the moment as well. Mm. Stephen. Yeah, look, um, I think I end up sort of as I often do in this, playing a certain role. Um, I think, I, I'm a little surprised that someone who's responsible at a council, and I'm not in any way condoning the behaviour of Grange or Lehman Brothers Australia, but I'm a little surprised that someone who is managing millions and millions of dollars at a council um, is investing in something that they clearly don't understand. Now, I'm sure it's going to be a lot more sophisticated than that, but I think we can't lose sight of you know, personal responsibility or institutional responsibility in some of this as well. Peter is absolutely right. I mean, the risks have to be transparent, and they weren't in that case. Uh, but because we can identify areas where people have made bad decisions, doesn't mean that we have to take away that decision-making power from people. And I think this is ultimately the challenge with disclosure and with the regulatory philosophy, is how do we get a balance right that uh, protects people to a degree from themselves, but is not actually taking away their autonomy, their ability to make their own decisions. You know. So the fact that someone makes a dumb call doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of people out there who make the right call. Uh, and if we're taking away from those people the right to make the call. I mean, that, that creates problems in its own, of its own. So I think that's, getting back to Kevin's original point, I mean, that's why we do need some sort of discussion about regulatory philosophy. We can't just say, well, because we can show demonst demonstrate areas where that has fallen down, we've got to throw all of that out and substitute mm -hmm. something else, and particularly when often what the substitution is is a form of, some form of paternalism. And, and, a, and a, of course, Australia's got a very permissive capital market, um, more so than perhaps the United Kingdom or the United States, particularly <laughs> in relation to contracts for difference, for example. Kevin? I was just going to try and follow up that, that point because I think one of the strengths of our GFC experience was that there were actually lots of losses. There were huge amounts of losses in terms of failures of agribusiness funds, <laughs> other financial firms that weren't regulated. And one of, the, one of the, the good things about that, if you can say there was a good thing, is that there really wasn't much in the way of any substantive attempt to claim back on the government. So even though we had, you know, freezes of, of uh, mortgage funds and so on, uh, yes, people grumbled and complained and lost a lot of money, but we did actually have a division between the potentially regulated sector where people expected to be protect protected and another area where they were responsible for, for their decisions. Now, probably a lot of those people shouldn't have been put in those in in those in those in that place, and that comes back to the question of design and marketing of products, and we need to, to think about that. But one of the dangers we face is the ever-expanding range of prudential regulation and not leaving enough opportunity for sensible and appropriate risk-taking that's needed for innovative uh, development of the economy. 
I mean, in that sense, do you, do you think there needs to be an open reflection uh, in the inquiry that another crisis is inevitable? That, that we, we need to socialize people to recognize that there is always going to be a risk? I guess if I said it, there was another crisis isn't inevitable, I'd be the one person in the room who would say that. But yes, I, we're always at risk of a, of a financial crisis and uh, uh, I think people need to be kept aware of the potential for mm. su substantial losses from complex products where there is high risk taking. Uh, I guess again going back to the GFC, I think one of the benefits we had was that we actually did have failures of a couple of banks mm. in the, uh, the start of the, uh, the 1980s, the, the two Vic Victorian and the uh, start of the 90s, wasn't it? Sorry, yeah. I keep forgetting which decade I'm in. Um, <laughs> the State Bank of Victoria and the Bank of South Australia and a couple of the major banks were uh, in some trouble. And I think that also helped us in terms of, you know, we haven't always had well-managed conservative banks. Mm. You know, there was a period there where following deregulation, we basically said to the banks uh, in the 80s, go out and do your thing, but didn't put in place good market discipline, good governance, good supervision and so on. So I think we want to be careful of the perception that people say, we've, we've got well-managed banks and we've always had well-managed banks. Mm. A bit of history sort of helps to, to put it in context that over the last 10, 15 years, mm. yes, but you know, wasn't always the case and may not be in the future. Well, indeed, and one of the interesting things that came out of the British Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards was an investigation into the failure of HBOS, and they found that there was a problem, basically, with its, its residential market uh, portfolio was, was okay, there was a problem with its corporate portfolio, uh, there was a problem with its treasury operations, and there was a problem with its international division. Now, the international division had um, a big operation in Dublin, and that lost 37% in terms of impairment charges. The second big part of that international operation was Bankwest, uh, before CBA took it over, and the uh, Parliamentary Commission of Banking Standards found that there was an impairment of its loan book in Australia, post-crisis, of 27%. It was pretty high. Is that a comment or a question? Sorry. No, no, it's just a, <laughs> you know, I mean, so right. The only comment I could make is that I'm a depositor of HBOS, and I, they did treat their depositors very well with cups of tea and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Let's open it up to questions from the floor. Um, Veronique's got a, a, a microphone. Uh, I'll stand up so I can see. Has anybody got a query, comment? It uh, just uh, relates to the, um, the great interview that uh, Justin did uh, with the um, Irish Central Bank uh, Governor. Um, and obviously Ireland went through uh, turmoil, et cetera, and its uh, banking system uh, declined in size. Um, there's been, you know, questions about is Australia's financial system too big or how big should it be and how it should uh, perhaps, you know, better support the real economy. Um, does, does the panel have some, some um, feedback on the, those sort of ideas? Okay, Stephen. Um, well, starting with whether it's too big, I'm not, I'm not quite sure how we're measuring too big, and I'm sure there are some academics in the room who can take me through endless papers on that. But, I mean, usually when it's presented to me, it's based on market capitalisation, which is in part, at least, driven by a flight to, you know, an ongoing flight to quality and security around the world. Because market cap's just what people think something is worth. It's not actually a measure of its place in the economy. Um, you know, that's probably the shortest answer is, you know, if we, if we were going to have a problem, we would have had it over the last six years. Now that, again, I caveat that very, very quickly by saying that's not a cause for complacency and it's not a cause for change and improvement, uh, for not making change and improvement. But we, we, there's an awful lot of trying to find the problems. It's almost as if Australia somehow feels left out. Now, everyone else had a bloody great big crisis and. We didn't, and you know, we've got to look and look and look until we find the reason why we're going to have one any minute now. Um, so look, I, I think you know, the answer lies, keep harping on about this, and I will for the next three or four years through the course of this whole process, is that we've got a system that is basically working well. Let's, it's like having a car that gets you from A to B and does it fine, but let's make sure we're using the right petrol, let's fine tune it, let's change the oil, you know, we're going to... Kevin's right, we can have a think about the destination to murder a metaphor. 
Um, but you know, let's not just constantly try and find the reason we're going to have a crisis, because everyone else had one and we missed out. Um, there, there is some academic literature out there emerging currently I knew there would where, be. where people have been estimating, using cross-country studies, uh, at what size financial sector does it stop contributing to economic growth. Uh, we'd be well above that figure. Now, uh, the, the papers, as I recall them, suggest that part of the reason is growth of trading and funds management as the main sort of less value-adding, non-value-adding parts of the financial sector. Um, but I guess the question you know, that one ha then has to ask is, well, how could it get so big if it's not adding value? What is there within the structure of the financial sector and incentives for customers of financial institutions and so on uh, to engage with the industry and, and, and let it grow? So, you know, yes, there might be some evidence that very large financial sectors uh, don't, you know, don't contribute to extra growth, but then one's got to ask, how do, how do they get so big if they're not providing value to customers. And I think that's a, an issue that well, one has to address. Open yeah. 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 Pauline, do you want to come in? Uh, Peter? OK. Yes, Deborah. This is a question for Pauline, really. Uh, earlier on, you were asked about um, how superannuation helps to achieve national outcomes. And you mentioned there, there are a few things that you feel are impediments to the best asset allocation. Those conflicts between short-term interests and long-term mm. investment. And uh, the issue of liquidity. What would you like to see come out of the FSI with regard to those matters? To quote Stephen, there's a rather large submission on, on this. I think there's... Um, Two issues. There's one, the impediments to long-term investing, particularly, and we talked about the real economy. Uh, investment in, in infrastructure is, is a real challenge and opportunity. Um, there is a pipeline that is emerging, absolutely. We've, first time we've seen a, a pipeline for quite some time, but it's not an investable pipeline at this moment for so, for, for so many funds because of the way the... Um, the risk is analysed. And I, I think there needs to be a lot more transparency, particularly around um, who bears the risk in a lot of assets. And that, that, that is a long conversation, and it's quite a political conversation. In terms of liquidity, there are a, a, a number of ways. One is to look at the liquidity requirements for funds themselves. And this will change as, as we move into post-retirement the way you can structure the system is that you won't have a 30-day call. You don't necessarily need to have a 30-day call on the money. And while ever you have that in our system, it does impact on the ability of funds um, to invest long-term and, and the need to have a very large liquidity pool. So I think it's time to look at, well, how can we start looking at longer redemption times yet still balance the need that people want to get access to, to their money, and also look at how we can actually provide a liquidity pool, a, a facility, and how we can do that across the financial system. And this is where you look at banks and other parts of the financial sector to be able to do that. With that, you get more and more interaction between the different, particularly the banking and the superannuation sector. And on that, and you, then you've got the possible issue of concentration risk because we're so interlinked. And what does that mean for the size of the system? And if there is another crisis, do we all come tumbling down together? Uh, and, and we're not there yet. We're just not, not there yet. But it's certainly, I think, a conversation we need to start having quite quickly. And uh, we go here first and then, and then Kingsley. Hi, Andrea Forbes from Suncorp. Um, a very important part of any industry are the skills of the people that work in it. Um, and to touch on David Murray's point, the culture. I guess if we're looking ahead 20 years, what does the regulator of the future look like, the superannuation industry worker of the future look like, and the banker of the future look like? Peter will have a lot less hair. 20, yeah. <laughs> 
look, perhaps um, I'll comment on what some of the other sectors look like. Uh, uh, in that um, one of the areas that ASIC has clearly had a focus on in well, for some time now, I was about to say recent years, but going back a, a little earlier, is uh, looking at how the competency and training levels of, uh, in particular, the financial advisors who are so critical to helping to manage the wealth and well-being of um, uh, Australians, uh, what sort of competency that we're, expect we're expecting there as a community and uh, looking at how that uh, can be appropriately lifted over time. So we'll, we'll continue to work with the industry on that to raise that level of professionalism. And I think the concept of professionalism here is an interesting one that goes beyond sort of mere technical skills. It goes beyond sort of, it goes to issues around ethics towards the way in which an industry, a profession deals with its consumers, uh, the relationship there, and seeing that evolve over time is going to be just as important, I think, Andrea, as, as the particular technical qualifications that people have. Uh, so I suppose, to conclude then, on that point, um, for whether it's the regulator, <laughs> super banking or whatever, uh, I think um, that, that concept of a profession, which frankly some of the sectors are not at right yet, uh, is, is going to be central. And the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards suggested whilst a laudable aim it will take a generation uh, to, uh, some to, of these, to actually achieve. Some of these areas are relatively new compared to what we would regard as professions elsewhere, whether it's medicine and whatnot. So um, there's, there's a bit of a journey still to be taken. But what underpins all of those traditional pr uh, professions, I suppose, is a commitment to society or societal oh. commitment. Uh, to what extent, basically, Stephen, do you think banking recognises its commitment to society? Uh, how long have you got, Justin? Mm -hmm. um, look, I think... Ten minutes. Good. Oh, excellent. No, I'd like to answer Andrew's <laughs> question as well. The, look, I think um, absolutely banking bankers, particularly the leadership of the industry, absolutely recognise that they do what they do within society and they have permission to do it within society and that there are therefore certain, you know, I've got to be careful language because people do read different things into it, but there's some sort of contract or there's some sort of, you know, quid pro quo or whatever between, between society and, and banks for the um, opportunities that we do get as, as bankers and, you know, certainly in Australia and I know this very well, there is a, a strong sense in the community that we don't always live up to, to that, um, the, the, to their expectations of our end of the deal. Just going back to, to Andrew's question, I think it's an insightful one because we, you know, the whole inquiry is about trying to prepare us for the, mm. for the future. Um, and my simple answer is, um, God knows. Um, and in part, and it's one area which hasn't had been touched on today, but it's, it's in part because we believe that banking is going to be hugely transformed, you know, certainly in 20 years, but even in the next five years. And a big driver of that is going to be technology. Mm. And one thing that we can be certain of is that it's going to be very disruptive, it's going to be very constructive, and it's going to bring in new competitors, huge innovation, new areas for competitive tension between existing players. But that's all we know. Um, as we're putting our own submission together, we sort of discovered that, you know, iPads, which, you know, I suppose, if, you know, because I'm familiar with them, which is not no small achievement for me as a troglodyte, um, that iPads have been around for a whole four years. Mm. I was at a presentation about 12 months ago where one of the big accounting firms said, if you'd done an IT strategy for your bank five years prior to that, so six years ago, you would have missed smartphones, you would have missed iPads mm. and iPods as part of your strategy. Your strategy would have looked pretty weak, given how important those are now in, in um, the way banking's going. So. One of the things that bankers will be in future is, is very IT savvy mm. because our customers are becoming increasingly IT savvy, driving us in that direction and expecting their banking to work like they expect everything else to work, whether it's you know eBay or Twitter or Facebook or whatever the new things are. Um, and that is very much shaping um, banking into the future. We actually discussed this uh I internally, and that's where we came up with that whole concept of duty of care. And we started off with the money. 
Uh, because it's taxpayer funded, funded, it's a compulsory system, it's about retirement outcomes and role in the economy, there is a level of duty of care that is different to of other money in the economy. And it's not just in superannuation funds, it's, it's invested throughout the economy, throughout the financial services and other asset allocation. So you've got to think about whoever is touching that money uh, at whatever level there is that need to discharge that duty of care. And how do we bring that in the way we do the regulation and public policy, I think is the dilemma because as we pointed out, that same level of duty of care over that money is not present at the moment. And so you have different outcomes and that's not necessarily sustainable going forward. Okay, uh, can I say? Just if I may just put a comment, Justin, that is that I, I would like to think that everybody working in any industry would think that they've got responsibilities to their customers and so on. But we know that everyone is not necessarily uh, well-intentioned. And this gets us into the awful area of remuneration and incentives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in Australia, I guess we st our regulators have stayed away from any discussion of should there be limits on incentive stru remuneration structures and so on, although APRA takes it into account, I guess, in, in the context of its capital requirements and so on. But, you know, I mean, that's, that's an area that you can't just talk about culture and not talk about remuneration and incentives. Having said that, I don't think we've had any discussions at all about remuneration in the, in the, in the committee so far, but you know, once you start to go down the route of talking about what are the objectives and, and approaches of, of, of people who have got uh, duties, you can't avoid that discussion. Yep. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question really relates to one of these philosophical issues of an inquiry. Um, Pauline made some excellent points about um, moving to um, uh, the annuity stage in retirement and the need therefore for income. So um, uh, the question really relates to how we kickstart the bond market here. You know, I, I started out in bonds and they've never been, never appeared to me to be complicated instruments. I mean, the yields go down, the value goes up. That seems to be the source of confusion um, for many people. Um, but the question really is, in Australia, we seem to have a very strange situation where it's very easy to buy what I regard as a complex instrument like a CFD or to dust your money on a, on a penny stock with um, not much disclosure. But it's been extraordinarily difficult to buy bonds for, for, for the average folk. And I'm going to ask you really, I confess directly to Stephen, is um, uh, have we perhaps been overly conservative in our banking practices in terms of how we document and issue those sorts of securities, and has that in fact impeded the, the growth of what otherwise could be quite liquid market? Um, look, I mean, we, we've got quite an interest in promoting the bond market, and without sort of going into huge detail, it sort of seems to be one of those classic chicken and egg situations. I mean, you, you talk to a whole pile of people who are potential issuers and say, well, we'll issue if there were buyers out there. You talk to people who are potential buyers and they say, well, we'd buy if people were issuing. So we. We've got to find a way of breaking the, breaking that loop. The specifics of your question, I'll, to be honest, I'm not really sure. I mean, you know, my instinct is to blame Peter and the regulator for um, loading up. Um, surprise, surprise. <laughs> surprise. <laughs> but um, look, I, 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 don't, I can't find anyone who's sort of opposed to the bond market being developed, but I find a lot of people scratching their head about, well, why isn't it happening organically or naturally? Um, and I think you know, we, we really do need to try and look, look at what's holding it back. And usually in those situations, it's no one or two things. It's usually a combination of a whole pile of, of little things. But certainly simplifying disclosure um, would be you know, part of being able to promote those. Oh, well, you can blame, uh, you can blame uh, me now. Uh, <laughs> where I, I, th I think Stephen's point about you know, no one, everyone's happy and keen to support the development of, of uh, that, that market, but there's not a single factor, I think, holding it back. And, and ultimately, it's not a regulator's role to say, you know, you should provide a particular product. Your starting point, though, I think, is one that Pauline has also touched on and is an important broader issue that David Murray mentioned the other day, and that is um, that uh, the super system uh, is weaker on in the retirement phase, in the decumulation phase. And we, we, I, I, I'm sure that Kevin is giving some thought along with his colleagues on the committee to what are some of the systems issues there that are inhibiting uh, the provision of products in that space. 
From ASIC's perspective, we've um, tested the market, say, for advice in that area, and advice is, is frankly of lower quality when it comes to the retirement phase compared to the accumulation phase, so there hasn't been a transition there. So it's overall, that's an area that I think um, does warrant some focus, both in terms of the breadth of the products and the advice. Uh, so with, with an ageing population, it's, it's an obvious area of focus for the inquiry. Okay. With that, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. I'd like to thank very much the panel for their insights for this afternoon. Uh, we're, we've got a deep and liquid market outside uh, for drinks in a moment. Uh, but first of all, David Gallagher has some closing words for the conference. But from, from us, thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you uh, for your participation with, uh, with us today. Um, it's been fascinating, all the different discussions that I've had and no doubt you have had as well. Um, what we've done today is we've attempted to address issues that are being debated, considered, uh, in certainly being discussed um, in the financial system inquiry, not that we're privy to things that are going on in there, but certainly this is the Academy's opportunity with other stakeholders to provide uh, insights into uh, activities in the system and suggestions about how things could be improved. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all the participants that uh, have participated uh, on the formal part of the program. Uh, also, um, thank you to the Financial System Inquiry Secretariat who've uh, attended. There's been a number of attendees today and in particular I'd like to thank uh, Kevin Davis, uh, John Lonsdale, Vicky Wilkinson and of course David Murray who presented earlier today. Um, just also wanted to uh, let you know about some of the activities that uh, CIFR is, is uh, looking to embark on as well as uh, present findings. Um, we're, un 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 uh, we're certainly uh, doing a number of targeted research initiatives and those targeted research initiatives are being driven by uh, stakeholders and what their needs and concerns are. And it's been an absolute uh, pleasure to be able to uh, participate in a couple of uh, areas that the financial system inquiry have asked us to look into. Um, one of those particular projects that we're looking at, uh, you know, supporting uh, the inquiry with uh, is uh, a data architecture project. And I don't know about you, but in Australia, financial data in our country is not, not the best. Um, it's an area that could be significantly enhanced. And uh, certainly when you have when you're looking at having a well-functioning financial system which, which has indicators like, you know, efficient, fair, resilient, those kind of things, you actually need data to determine whether or not you're hitting the, hitting the right mark. So um, we're, we're interested in doing a, a project uh, with, our, with our, uh, our stakeholders uh, to look at what sort of design uh, might actually help support the system. We're also engaged in... Uh, in some work that uh, should start soon um, in competition in financial services, another inquiry that's going on. And we have also a number of uh, executive education programs that we're uh, launching in the second half of this year. We also later in the year will be uh, reporting and doing a major launch of some work that we've been fortunate enough to be doing um, that involves the Future Fund on long-term investing. So uh, that's around about October or November. Uh, we also have a project that uh, we're uh, working on in portfolio disclosure, uh, which was presented uh, in part today. Also, a major uh, event, um, Justin O'Brien's uh, research uh, looking at benchmarks and manipulation of benchmarks. Um, there's a, a project that's in your uh, information pack uh, that uh, is going to be at Harvard, and then there'll be some other uh, events that he's running in London, also in Sydney. So just in conclusion, um, an area that I can't help but um, ask the FSI to contemplate. Um, we're academics. We are independent. We like to think that we're smart, that we're resourceful, that we train the next generation of leaders. We typically deal in issues that are about public goods. So it's um, not always, but uh, public goods, it's very hard to get a sponsor sometimes to sponsor all of the research that uh, a financial system should be concerned about. So my, my question or my consideration for the FSI to perhaps contemplate is uh, what people, skills and resources could or should be provided by the academy 
as independent experts in the field, um, as the financial system no doubt evolves, and how can, how can these skills be supportive to a well-functioning, uh, resilient, efficient and healthy financial system? Something to ponder. Uh, just in conclusion, thank you again for your participation with us. Uh, I believe we've had a very successful day. A lot of issues have been discussed and uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, drinks um, and nibbles outside in the, uh, in the function area outside. Thank you again. Thank you.